Hello and welcome to practice number 12 of Circuit Lab. We'll focus on LED diodes and operational amplifiers. My name is Mr. Burleson and you may reach me at geaux15 at hotmail.com. So in the previous practice we went over the types of switches including single pole single throws, single pole double throws, double pole single throws, and double pole double throws as so some of the more common types of switches. We also talked about fuses uh, as, a, as a safety device to prevent uh, overcurrent situations. We also talked about circuit breakers and how they don't burn out, but they actually trip, which is basically like a switch that automatically fails open uh, when, uh, when you have an overcurrent situation, and so they can be reset. We talk about how to solve for dependent sources. Now, dependent sources, um, uh, generally, you have a voltage or a current source which is dependent on something else in the circuit, which can actually uh, make the problem much more difficult to solve, but used quite a bit in uh, amplifier problems. We talked about superposition and how you, you can use superposition when you have multiple independent sources. It does not work with dependent sources and it does not work with power, but you can take out individual dependent sources, or excuse me, you can take out individual independent sources and then uh, solve, solve your circuit multiple times and then add them up at the end. But let's talk about a diode. Now this is going to be for division C only. So a diode is a two terminal, in other words it's got an in and an out um, electronic component. Okay, It generally conducts current in one direction. So it's got asymmetric conductance. In other words one way it, it acts very much like a short and the other way the current tries to flow it very, acts very much as an open. Okay, it has low, ideally zero resistance or a short in one direction and high, ideally infinite or open resistance in the other direction. Okay, so if we talk about an ideal diode, it's a short when it's forward biased or closed or turned on. It is an open when reverse biased and open switch are turned off. Okay, now keep in mind real diodes have a very small resistance depending on their semiconductor material and they also tend to have what is called a forward bias voltage okay uh, it's usually about 0.6 to 0.7 for silicon diodes it's 0.25 to 0.3 for germanium diodes now keep in mind some leds can be as high as like four volts okay and if you look off to the right this is a voltage versus current curve. And what you'll notice is, is that once we get above the forward bias voltage, uh, pretty much it acts very much like a short. So that's the far, far right hand side that says forward. If you notice when it's in reverse bias condition, okay, virtually no current is getting through, so it's very much acting like an open. However, when we get really negative, we actually break down the uh, PN junction of the diode and we get into what they call avalanche conditions or, or, or breakdown conditions where it again acts as a short because we've just basically overwhelmed the diode. The, you, you see the circuit diagram for the diode which is just basically a triangle with a line on one end and the line is where the cathode is and then the part without the line is the anode, okay? And so what you'll notice is, is that the current flows in the direction of the arrow, okay? If it flows. It does not flow, uh, you know, uh, so my, uh, one of my uh, professors used to say, uh, when it tries to flow the other way, the, uh, the uh, straight line stops it. But, uh, of course, and then below you see what one actually looks like, and they'll always indicate which is, which is the cathode. So, an ideal diode has zero resistance and forward bias, and reverse bias, it has infinite resistance. So, if I look at the, if I look at the uh, example below, where I've got VS that's uh, driving that diode with a resistor, and then I've got an output, which is basically my voltage across the resistor, 
okay, you'll notice that when Vs uh, gets above the forward bias voltage, okay, it very much looks like a short, as in the lower right hand side. However, when it is below the forward bias voltage, it very much looks like an open, so no current flows. Okay, and so like some of the uh, current diagrams for an ideal diode is provided in the in the lower left hand side, you'll notice that uh, basically the VI curve goes completely vertical at zero volts. However, there's really going to be it'll be slightly offset by the forward bias voltage. Okay, so if you look at in the lower right hand side with the red the red line shows you an ideal diode but like a real diode it's still it goes sort of similar but it's offset by the forward bias voltage which is about 0 0.7 volts for a silicon diode okay and if you want to replace it in a uh, in a circuit what you do is is that when it's forward biased even though it's it's closed you put in a 0 0.7 volt battery facing the other direction and so then that way, what it does is, is that it shows the voltage drop across the, uh, across the diode. And if they give you the very small resistance that is in that real diode, you could also put that in there as well. But light emitting diodes are a special type of diode that emit a light when activated. The color is determined by the energy band gap of the semiconductor, which also affects the voltage drop. So I put a full table of all of this in the homework generator under the LED data sheet, uh, data sheet tab. Okay. Now, uh, you can also find it on Wikipedia as well. Now, what they'll normally do is that when you have a light emitting diode, they'll either put a box that says LED and with a direction, or they'll do the LED symbol with like uh, pictures of the light emitting as you see here. Also make sure that you've got in your binder multiple copies of different cutouts of the different parts of a, of a diode of a LED. So for a diode practice okay let's say this is our diode problem okay what we want to do is that we've got ideal diodes so there's no forward bias voltage the forward bias voltage is zero there, there's no, there's no resistance in the diode. It's zero as well. And so, what ends up happening is, is that you don't know which ones of these diodes are turned on and which ones of these diodes are turned off. Okay. Now, what you have to do to solve it, da da da, is that you actually solve it for all four conditions. So it's much like a switch problem. So. I solve it for D1 on and D2 on, on, you know, what if they're both on? And what you find out is, is that if they're both on, okay, the current can't go that way. So therefore, um, uh, that one uh, would not work, okay? Then I try for D1 off and D2 on. Okay, and what you find out is that that one also did not work. Okay, because what you'll notice is is that I had plus 10 volts and plus 3 volts, so obviously D1 would have been on in that particular case. Okay, so we go down to what if they were both off? Okay, well if they're both off, there's no current going through the 6 kilo ohm resistor, so therefore that's 0 volts. Okay, and uh, the one that, then I'd have three volts and ten volts, and so that didn't work. But what if D1 was on and D2 was off? And what you find out is that if D1 is on, okay, and D2 is off, then the then the voltage right above the six kilo ohm resistor is six volts, and the voltage you know on on the other side of that other diode is three volts, and so that actually makes sense. That one made perfect sense. So, but you have to try all four different combinations to see which ones are valid. Okay, so it's much like a problem. Now, real diode problems using ideal diodes. So what you do with a real diode problem is that you replace those ideal diodes with a, 
or excuse me, you replace the real diodes with the ideal diode in series with your forward bias voltage, the opposite direction of the current, and a resistance. Okay. Now keep in mind that RF is going to be really small, and we already know that the V on is anywhere from 0 0.6 for silicon to like 0 0.3. Uh, usually for germanium, or it might be 4 volts if it's an LED, okay? But now let's switch gears and let's talk about an operational amplifier. Now, an operational amplifier, also referred to as an op amp, is a, as a basically a high-gain voltage amplifier. It's a differential input, which means that it amplifies the difference, Okay. And it usually has a single-ended output. In other words, so if I look at the diagram on the right, there will be a plus and a minus input, okay? And there will be an output. Now, you'll notice that in pins 4 and 7, you've got V plus and V minus. And what those are is that those, that's the power, if you will, for the operational amplifier. It's a very complex circuit. And you actually apply a high amount of voltage to power this uh, amplifier because it's got to get that extra juice from somewhere, okay? And so if we were amplifying, let's say, a an audio signal that might be very, very small, okay, but I put in a very large amount of V plus and V minus, then it can amplify uh, quite a bit, okay? This is very popular due to its versatility as a, as a differential amplifier and you can set it up easily as a comparator, inverting amplifier, or non-inverting amplifier. However, because we have all this complex circuitry, and because we have the the power coming in from V plus and V minus, which normally is not even shown, you really can't do a KCL at the output of an op amp. Okay, so that's really important. It's the one place where we never ever do a KCL. So, now, so what does an ideal op amp look like? It's going to have infinite gain, which we know isn't possible. It's going to have infinite input resistance. So if I look at the inside guts, if you will, of the of the uh, of the amplifier, okay. If I look at it, the difference between V plus and V minus is what we're going to call V in, okay. And what we're saying is is that the G in this diagram would be infinite okay well given the fact that we use real circuits and vs plus and vs minus are not infinite that's impossible we're also going to say that vn the resistance that it faces under rn is infinite it's not infinite but it is ridiculously high okay then we're also going to say we're going to have an infinite output voltage range. So that means because we can do infinite gain, the output is infinite. We're also going to have what they call a common mode rejection ratio and a power supply re reject ratio of infinite, which of course neither one of those are possible as either. Now, because Rn is infinite, that means that the voltage okay going into v plus and coming out of v minus is actually going to be zero we're also that r out is going to be zero because it's it's so well made there's no internal resistance there's going to be no noise okay uh and none of these are actually actual so but the two rules the for a an, an op amp that you should always remember is that if it's an ideal op amp, that V plus is equal to V minus, always. And the current going in to V plus and the current going in or coming out of V minus are also zero. You follow those two rules, you can solve any op amp problem. So let's talk about the three main uses of an op amp. The first one is a comparator, okay? So if I have VN, and that's my input voltage, okay? And I, uh, and if it is anything in this particular case, because the voltage at V minus, since there's no current coming out of there, is equal to ground, 
If it's anything, my V out is infinity. Okay, so if V plus is greater than V minus, then it gives you the maximum output voltage. But now if V, uh, if uh, if V minus is less than V plus, then it gives them negative out output voltage. So what it does is is that uh, if if you put in zero volts, you get zero. But if it's a little higher, you get maximum positive, and if it's a little le lower, you get you get uh, negative. Now you'll notice that there is a an error on here because uh, the V minus and V plus uh, actually should have just remained where they were, and I shouldn't I shouldn't have swapped them around. So this is called a comparator. Inverting amplifier is probably the most common uh, amplification that I've seen. So basically what you do here is that you have an, an RN resistor and an RF resistor. And the ratio of those two resistors okay, will determine what the gain is of this output. Because you'll notice that the V plus is driven to zero. I attached it to ground. And then, so that means that V minus is equal to zero. So the current going through RN is equal to VN minus zero over RN, okay? And since the current can't go into the negative side of the uh, inverting amplifier, it has to go through the RF. So then the voltage there is equal to zero minus V out over RF is equal to Vn over Rf, okay? So then I can figure out that the ratio between V out and, and Vn is equal to minus Rf over Rn. So if I use a really big resistor for Rf and a really small resistor for Rn, I can get a massive amount of gain. Or if they're very close, it'll be, it'll be very close to just negative one. Now, a non-inverting amplifier is where I take Vn and I put it into the positive side. And then on the negative side, what I do is I put in two resistors. I put an R1 and an R2, such that the R1 is grounded on one side, and on the other side, it's into the, the negative value of V, or the negative, the negative input of the operational amplifier. So the node between R1 and R2, its voltage would be exactly equal to Vn, because remember, the voltage at the nodes is forced to be the same. So therefore, the current going through R1 is equal to 0 minus Vn. And so that's the current. And since the current cannot come out of the negative side of the operational amplifier, it has to go through R2. So then, if I look at that current, it's the same current is equal to V out minus Vn. So V out minus Vn over R2 is equal to that same current. Using that, my gain comes out to 1 plus R2 over R1. So if I use a very large resistor on R2 and a very small resistor on R1, I can get a very large uh, forward gain. So what to do if it's a more complex operational amplifier circuit? Simplify the drawing to make it easier to see or you know, or see if it's one of the common types. A lot of times what they'll do is they'll draw it up so it looks really complex, but it really is one of the common types. Simplify by combining resistors you have seen previously by combining those in parallel, those in circuits, and repeating. In other words, you're always simplifying the circuit. Simplify the same circuits using KVLs and KCLs. However, remember, we never do a KCL at the terminal or at the, at the output of an operational amplifier. Always use the golden rules of an op amp, but never ever do a KCL at the output of an operational amp. So if I look at this particular problem, now you'll notice uh, they use the downward arrow, which is used quite often to indicate ground. Okay, so if I look at this problem really, really closely, okay, uh, I can look at it and I go, wait a second, this looks very similar to some of the other ones I've seen, okay? So I know that the input at the positive side of the operational amplifier is zero. So therefore the input at the negative side is also zero, okay? Now 
looking at the situation here, I can go. So now I know that this one in particular looks very, very similar to an inverting amplifier. Okay. And I go, so now I've just got to solve for for all the resistance and so if I know that Vs, the current going through Vs is equal to Vs minus zero over one kilo ohm. Okay, so I just solve for that solve for that current and that's the same current going through the five kilo ohm resistor. Okay, so that same current goes through the five kilo ohm resistor and then I can then take that zero and then I can uh, that's at the negative side or on the left hand side of the 5 kilo ohm resistor and I know the current so I can figure out what the voltage is between R2, R4 and R3. Okay now that I know the voltage there I then find out the leakage current that goes through the 1 kilo ohm resistor down to ground. Okay and so now I know the current that goes through R4 and by knowing the current that goes through R4 I can then figure out exactly how much voltage I, ha I have lost through R4 and G should come out to negative 20. So as you see here is the details on how I solved that. So I solved it using nodal analysis at K, B, and C. You will notice I never do a case a uh, KCL if you will at C never so let's look at this one okay now this one at first blush you're like oh my gosh this is super complex but in reality okay this one's actually sort of simple okay now what's going to end up happening here is I'm going to look and I see the feedback for R3 and R4 and it just screams non-inverting amplifier. So if I take the voltage at the positive side of the operational amplifier and call that my Vn, if you will, it is straight up a non-inverting amplifier. And so then I've just got to solve for Vn. And Vn is a very simple, uh, what we'll call a, um, uh, it's a very simple voltage division problem okay so now I use VA and VB do the voltage division to determine VN so first thing I do is I is just looking at the op amp and the 20 kilo ohm and the 0.5 kilo ohm that's obviously a non-inverting amplifier and I ignore the rest of the circuit that part I can solve real and it's got a gain of 41 wow that's magnificent Okay, now I notice that VA and VB is a simple voltage divider, okay, where I can figure out the VN, or in this case V plus, is equal to 2VA plus B divided by 3. And that makes perfect sense because if I look at it, uh, you know, VA and VB, you know, you've got, twice, you've got twice the resistance in VB as you do in VA, okay? Then I combine them such that VO is equal to 41 times V plus, and that's where I get my 13.67 times 2VA plus VB. Again, as we've said before, when you argue an illegal question, when you're in a competition, make sure you, you are doing it in a respectful way. You're very specific. Make sure you've reread and reread both the question and the rules to make sure that you that you've identified a potential issue, and ask the question of how do you do it while following this one specific rule. Okay, never you know accuse them of being wrong or whatever. What you're really trying to do is saying, hey, look, I want to answer this question. But I want to do it within the rules. And a lot of times uh, the event supervisors made a mistake and then they'll say, well, answer it this way or what have you. And then you just go forward for your homework. All right. We're we're getting to the point where your binder should be in very good shape. I want you to do your circuit problems for level 15 diodes and level 16 operational amplifiers. Actually, I'm not sure the operational amplifiers one is completed just yet. 
uh, I'd like you to also do these in-class practice problems on your own, showing all your work, making sure that your work can be followed by others. This is going to go into your binder so that you'll know how to do it. I want you to design an inverting amplifier with a gain of a negative 100 using six resistors and an ideal op amp. Okay, now think about that. I want you to use six resistors. And so what you're probably going to do is you're going to make a, uh, you're going to design a circuit or a, or a resistor network that gives you uh, a particular resistance and, and a, on one side and a particular resistance on another side. Okay. I also want you to design a non-inverting amplifier with a gain of three. Okay, and again, using five resistors and an ideal op amp. Now you're probably thinking, holy smokes, he's always asking me to use a whole bunch of resistors. Yes, I am. And I want you to get used to that of designing a resistor network for a given resistance. And then I want you to put it into your non-inverting amplifier. And by the way, both of these designs are going to look a lot more complex, but when you break them down, they're going to look like just a standard inverting amplifier and a standard non-invert amplifier. Now I want you to design a circuit using diodes that will turn on a green LED okay, when the input voltage Vn is greater than 3 volts. And I want you to assume forward bias voltages. Okay? So in other words, I want you to, I want you to design a circuit such that when the voltage gets above 3 volts, the green LED turns on. When it's below that, it shouldn't turn on. Now, I also want you to design a circuit using diodes that will, that will only have positive voltage outputs. In other words, if it's ever a negative voltage, okay, when it, if it's ever negative, you will have zero output, okay? Now, do not assume forward bias voltages, so I want you to use ideal diodes. Thank you so much, and good luck.